I have watched a lot of educational math videos over the years, and recently I realized that there is something about the way that proof by contradiction is used that I don't really think aids in understanding. So in this video, I would like to talk about the two most common proofs that this problem applies to. But to first illustrate what I'm talking about, let me give you a toy example. So say I want to prove the theorem, there is no largest counting number. A proof by contradiction might look something like this. Assume there is a largest counting number, let's call it n. Now consider the number n plus 1 n plus 1 is a counting number that is larger than n. This contradicts the assumption that n is the largest number. Therefore, there is no largest counting number. Now, this proof is fine. It works. It does prove the theorem. But if someone was asking you, is there a largest counting number? Then I think it would be a mistake to use this proof for two reasons. First of all, Proofs by contradiction are hard to understand. Like, you assume something is untrue, and then math breaks, and that's a good thing? If you've never been exposed to a proof by contradiction before, then you're not likely to immediately pick it up. They take some time to get used to. But the second reason I think that you shouldn't be using this proof is that it's, it's actually a direct proof, disguised as a proof by contradiction. Let's take a look at what the middle part of the proof by contradiction is actually saying. For a given number n, n plus 1 is always bigger, right? In other words, for every counting number, there exists a larger counting number. But that's just a reformulation of the theorem that we set up to prove. So we don't actually need all the contradiction parts, we only really needed the actual meat of the argument. This situation, where the proof by contradiction is actually a direct proof in disguise, is more common than you might think. And it's especially common with the proof that I'm talking about next. But first, let me set the stage a bit. So we're gonna talk about factorizations, which means splitting up a number into its factors. So for instance, if we have the number 70, then we can write that as 10 times 7. 10 times 7 is a factorization of 70. Furthermore, we can write 10 as 2 times 5. Now our factorization of 70 looks like 2 times 5 times 7. But from here, there is nothing else we can do. All the numbers left cannot be factorized. Numbers that cannot be factorized further are called prime numbers, and the factorization involving only prime numbers is called a prime number factorization. So this sort of begs the question, how many prime numbers are there? And as it turns out, there are infinitely many, and we're gonna prove that. So, how do you prove that there is an infinite number of primes? Well, let me grab some primes. Any, any primes will work. I'm gonna take my absolute favorites, 2, 3, and 11. And next, I'm gonna multiply them together, which is gonna yield this really big, like super big number, impossible to calculate. Don't worry, we don't need to calculate it. But I do want you to notice that it is divisible by all of the numbers that we used. That is to say, it's divisible by 2, it's divisible by 3, and it's divisible by 11. Now let me ask you, what happens if we add 1 to this number? Well, for starters, this new number is not going to be divisible by 2. We know this because every other number is divisible by 2. So if we started with something that is divisible by 2 and then add 1, then we're going to wind up at something that isn't divisible by 2. Similarly, every third number is divisible by 3, right? So if we started with something divisible by 3 and add 1, then we're going to get something that isn't divisible by 3. And, of course, it's not going to be divisible by 11 either, because every 11th number is divisible by 11. So what we've done here is we have constructed a number that is divisible by none of the primes in the original list. So either my number is prime in its own right, or it's factorizable into primes that aren't 2, 3, or 11. 
Regardless then, we know that there is at least one more prime number out there. Since we did this with three prime numbers, that means that there are in total at least four prime numbers. But the prime numbers I chose were completely arbitrary. If I instead take 10 prime numbers and then do this whole procedure, multiply them together and add one, then we'll still find that there is at least one more prime number out there, which means that there are at least 11 prime numbers in total. If we do this to a list of 757 prime numbers, then we will find that there is still one more prime number out there, so we know that there are at least 758 prime numbers. This argument works for any finite list of prime numbers, which means that for any finite list of prime numbers, that list does not include every prime number. And that's the same thing as saying that there is an infinite number of prime numbers. Now this is a direct proof, but as I hinted at before, it's usually formulated as a proof by contradiction. How it usually goes is, you assume there is a finite number of prime numbers, you then go through the same procedure as we outlined before, where you, in this case, multiply every prime number in existence together and add one. This shows that there is one more prime number out there, which contradicts the notion that we were using every prime number. Since this led to a contradiction, that means that our assumption was false, and there is in fact an infinite number of primes. So this formulation, as a proof by contradiction, is the same as the direct proof, but with a, an assumption tacked on the beginning and a contradiction tacked on to the end. And I want to highlight specifically how confusing it can be for someone who isn't accustomed to a proof by contradiction. Like, you do all of this logical reasoning, and then at the end you say, oops, we broke math, and so none of what we did is actually true. And that's not to say that you can't use proof by contradiction when teaching someone. I just think it's unwise to do so unnecessarily because it adds a complicated extra step. The final example I want to look at is Cantor's diagonal argument. For those unfamiliar, Cantor's diagonal argument is most often used to show that there are more real numbers between 0 and 1 than there are counting numbers. We can show this by pairing up every counting number with some real number between 0 and 1. Essentially so that we have a first real number, a second real number, a third real number and so on. The goal is to show that regardless of which specific real number we have paired with each counting number, there is always going to be one real number that hasn't been paired with any counting number. That is to say, regardless of what pairing we used, every natural number can be accounted for, but not every real number. Let us construct a real number that hasn't been accounted for. If we look at the first real number in a list, at the first decimal, we have a four. Let me choose the first decimal of my new number to be something other than four. Next, let's look at the second real number and the second decimal of that number. In this case, that's a three. So I'm gonna choose that the second decimal of my number is different from three. Then we choose that the third decimal of my new number is different from the third decimal of the third number in my list of real numbers. And the fourth decimal of our new number will be different from the fourth decimal of the fourth number and the fifth decimal will be different from the fifth decimal of the fifth number, and so on and so forth. What we've managed to do is construct a number that uh, is explicitly different from the first real number in the list, since it's different at the first decimal place. It's necessarily different from the second number in the list, because it's different at the second decimal it's different from the hundredth number in the list because it's going to be different in the hundredth decimal. This new number then cannot be paired with any counting number because the real number paired with any counting number is going to be different from my new real number in a specific decimal place. And to be clear here, this is not due to the specific pairing that we chose. 
because this argument holds regardless of what actual pairing we choose. If we choose a different pairing, we can still show that there is at least one real number that hasn't been paired to any counting number. And since there is no pairing between counting numbers and real numbers such that every real number is accounted for, that means that there are more real numbers between 0 and 1 than there are counting numbers. Now this is an argument that is also fairly commonly stated as a proof by contradiction. But again the contradiction part is just kind of tacked on. It goes something like, assume we have a pairing where all real numbers are accounted for. Then we do the whole diagonalization thing and it turns out there is one real number not accounted for, therefore contradiction. And again I think that that is an unnecessary extra step to do. This is already complicated enough I feel. And you'll notice that all three of these proofs that we've gone through are very similar in nature. They all revolve around finding the size of some set by showing that we can always find another element. So there seems to be something about that structure that makes people want to encapsulate the proof in a proof by contradiction. Now I want to emphasize there's really nothing wrong with using proof by contradiction. Just be careful that you're not doing it unnecessarily and just overcomplicating things. So just keep this in mind the next time you want to explain to someone why there's an infinite number of primes or you know whatever. And uh, thank you for watching.